Um, I have a little allergic thing going on this morning, so I apologize about my voice. I hope I don't sneeze in the middle of this presentation. This was a, a trial that we thought up back in 2009 based on a drug that we use in multiple sclerosis to improve walking. And when I started um, seeing patients with transverse myelitis, I would um, consider prescribing this medication for them, but insurance would roundly reject it and say, we're not covering this drug. It's only approved for MS. There's no data in transverse myelitis, we thought. Let's put this trial together. Let's get um, you know, a whole bunch of patients enrolled and see if, if this drug actually helps. So that's what we did. And um, we decided to do it in a very rigorous way so that we could tell for sure if it helps. We weren't just going to ask patients, does this help you? We were going to test them in many different ways. And this ended up being the very first therapeutic trial in transverse myelitis. We started in 2009. We just finished now. It took a long time. Um, the group that we included was just folks who had a single lesion because we did this technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation to measure the conduction speed in the spinal cord across this lesion. We only wanted patients to have one lesion so it wouldn't mess up our results. But this could be extrapolated to patients who have more than one lesion now that uh, we have the, um, the trial completed. We think it may be helpful for more than just patients with the monophasic transverse myelitis. Here's the design. Every patient was going to spend eight weeks taking the drug and eight weeks taking a placebo pill. And during each eight-week period, we measured your walking time, how fast you would walk, 25 feet. We measured it every two weeks during an eight-week arm, so four times. And we had a, a period of time called a lead-in um, before each arm to make sure that there was no placebo effect, that we could account for a placebo effect. And what we considered to be a response, so what we wanted to see if the drug was working, is that you had to walk faster six out of those eight weeks while you're on the drug compared to your fastest walk in the placebo. So this was a very high threshold to meet, but we wanted to be sure that the drug was actually doing what we thought it would do. Here's the group of patients who participated. Um, I think there's someone in the audience you may be here who participated. Thank you very much. This was a very hard study to recruit for. You had to commit to being in Baltimore for six months or so to get through this whole thing beginning to end um, and to come to our clinic and go through all the tests every two weeks. It was a lot to ask, so we do appreciate it. The group we recruited was a fairly homogenous population of transverse myelitis patients. Um, it was mostly people who could afford the time, who were age 55 approximately, but we did have one college student from Georgia drive up to Baltimore every two weeks. So thank you for that. Um, most of these people, uh, the requirement was that you had to have a walking deficit. You couldn't be walking perfectly after your transverse myelitis. You had to walk a little slower than the average. So that was one of the criteria for getting in. And as it turns out, the drug did not meet its primary outcome. So when you, when you ran through all the statistics, looking at walking speeds on the drug at week two, week four, week six, and week eight, although it seems like uh, the black bars are longer in uh, two of these arms at week two and at week eight compared to the placebo, it did not meet the statistical significance. So it technically did not meet its primary outcome. Now, I've been accused of being too optimistic, but when you look at uh, the number of patients who did meet the primary outcome, it was four, four out of 12. And those four people walked an average of 15% faster. And when you compare these numbers to multiple sclerosis data, especially when they were first doing these trials, they're almost identical. So presumably, if we had a patient population as big as MS, and we could recruit all these people into a trial, my feeling is that it would be very similar. We did a lot of secondary outcome measures. We looked at uh, disability levels in panel A, uh, and people got, uh, seemed to be less disabled. We looked at strength in the hands and in the hips, and uh, these black bars on the right side indicate that there was increased strength 
We did an endurance walk, so you had to walk for two minutes straight, and we timed how long it would take you. And the faster you walked, um, would, you'd have a longer bar here, and the people, when they were in, in the arm taking the drug, seemed to have more endurance than when they, they were in placebo. And then this balance test, walking in, into four different squares on a floor, that was the only one that was statistically improved, but all three of the other ones also so, showed trends towards improvement. So if we had more patients, I suspect these would be statistically meaningful and, uh, um, again, similar to, to multiple sclerosis. There were no significant adverse events. There was nobody who had a seizure, for example, which is one of the big fears with a drug like this that stimulates the neurological system. We did see most of the same adverse effects that we see in multiple sclerosis. Um, that includes urinary urgency. There's like a, a chemical irritation that goes on in the bladder. Uh, people complained about not being able to fall asleep. There was um, some subjective weakness that we could not reproduce on, on exam. Some people complained about fatigue and muscle stiffness. But none of these rose to any level that we had to report to the FDA. So there were no real significant risks. So here's the summary of the finding. Um, again, no, no, primary, no uh, change in walking speed that was statistically significant. This, was, this did not meet its end point. But we, did, we do have uh, reason for optimism. Again, there were four uh, responders out of 13. And th those are numbers very similar to multiple sclerosis. There were strong trends in our secondary outcome measures suggesting this drug helps in speed. It helps with endurance, it helps with strength, and it helps with balance. And again, it was very well tolerated with no real safety risks. And it really suggests that patients with transverse myelitis who have a walking deficit, if they want to try this drug, it's certainly reasonable to try it. I mentioned at the beginning that we included an outcome called transcranial magnetic stimulation. What it is is a big magnet that goes over your scalp. I did this myself, it doesn't hurt. It sends an impulse into the brain, and it temporarily shuts down that part of the brain. So you could uh, stimulate or, or turn off a part of the brain. In this case, what we did was we stimulated the part of the brain that causes your finger to move or your, your knee to move. And so it's really neat because you know, they'll, they'll tell you three, two, one, and then they'll send an impulse into your brain, and you see your finger move or you see your knee move. And the whole point of this, though, is so that we can measure the speed of electrical conductance between the brain and the finger, or between the brain and the knee. So we could see if this medication actually improves electrical conductance in those tissues. Here's the idea. You saw this in Dr. Becker's talk yesterday. The nerve is in green. The myelin hamburger bun looking thing is in yellow and red. And the, the more myelin you have, the faster your electrical conductance. When you have myelin breakdown, and um, then you have loss of electrical conduction. If you have damage to the axon, then not only is it going to take longer for the um, signal to get through, but you'll have less signal getting through. So with this transcranial magnetic stimulation, we're looking for two possible outcomes. One is that the signal would still get through, which, which would suggest this picture here, just breakdown of the myelin, but the axon is intact. The other possibility is the signal would be lower and slower because of both disruption to the axon and demyelination. And these are a lot of numbers just to tell you that we saw this picture. It was disintegration of myelin. So the signal was intact. When it got to the finger, when it got to the knee, the amplitude was fine. The brain was getting the signal to those limbs, but it was just getting there slower. And that really pointed to a pathology that looked more like myelin disruption as opposed to axonal damage. So that's really cool. This is like a, a way that we could interrogate the pathology of transverse myelitis without actually doing a biopsy. So we concluded from that that transverse myelitis, at least in this patient population, the group that we recruited here, seemed to be more demyelinating and that there was potential for recovery with a drug like Delfampredine, um, but maybe also with uh, a product like a stem cell trial, because the axons seem to be intact and they are amenable to treatment. And of course, um, the idea here was that 
we could look at the, the drug that we were using, Ampira, Delfampridine, and we could see that the conduction was faster with the drug. These are my kids, two girls at the top, and Josh at the bottom. Happy to take questions, or maybe we'll save them for the end, right, Dr. Greenberg? <laughs>